cold wind blows playfully across the water. Picking up speed, it gusts over the barren tundra and races across ice-capped water, whisking moist droplets into the thin air. It whirls and whistles, sending icy crystals of snow and stinging fury against trees, homes, and people. This is the land of the Inupiat Eskimo. Into this Arctic vastness, a baby boy was born more than 150 years ago. When I was growing up, um, I hear Dad used to tell us a story about Manilak. This man was a prophet. They call him prophet. That's uh, my dad's uncle. He's a good prophet. That time, nobody was talk about God. There's. They don't know about heaven. Only that man. He always mentioned what he said. It's from above, not from the ground, not from the world. It's from above. That was our God. Nothing is known of his father. He was raised by his mother. She called him Manilik. Others sometimes called him Manilorik. Manilik, when they look back of that man, he's uh, he uh, God spoke to him and just like a prophet in in those Bible days. You know, there's prophet in in the Bible days. Then. It happened up there too through that Manila. He's a prophet, then we can see nowadays, we can see he's one of them, because he prophesied what will happen. When Manilik was born, the natives of the northwest Arctic region of Alaska were ruled by the Inutkut, or shamans. In the mid-1800s, no missionaries had yet penetrated this hostile land. Yet Manilik was a worshiper of the Creator God, whom he called Grandfather. He held communion with this unseen power and foretold changes to take place in the lives of his people, changes signaled by the coming of men with white skin, changes that would bring an end to life as they knew it. My father, he always talking about this uh, Manila. He's a prophet. When they, f when they knew about the prophets, when the white man came, they knew that for sure that the prophet. And this Manila uh, was before the white man, and he was talking about. Uh, the people that came from the south, 
it's white color. And he said, they bring books. They bring the books. And people will understand these books. They know about God. They know something, it's a lot of power. More than an evil way of power. And people will know something that's real power. When they talk, when they talk from these books, that means now we understand that was the Bible. That's for sure. And I always had an interest in um, knowing more of history of uh, Manila. He was something that um, a, a person that had started the religion, you know, in, in, in a sense, to get the people to, uh, to overcome fear. The story of Manilik is told by those who heard it from their fathers, who heard it from their fathers, who perhaps even knew him themselves. According to the custom of the Inupiat, each person preserves and passes on to his children the stories he has heard from his own parents, grandparents, or other relatives. Manilik was born and lived along the Kobuk River. He traveled extensively during his life, sharing what his grandfather above had told him. He is said to have traveled as far west as the Bering Sea and eastward into Canada, where he was last seen. Manelik learned how to build the sod house for the winter, how to snare small animals for food, and how to ice fish. As he grew older, Manelik provided food for his mother and three sisters, hunting and setting the snares by himself, armed with his trusty bow and arrows. One day, while checking his snares, he noticed an inviting place to sit down and rest. The strange-sounding call of a small bird attracted his attention. He listened closely. Tatagik, Tatagik. The words meant father and child, or father and son. Manilik found himself often drawn to this spot where he would linger, surrounded by a feeling of unusual calm and peace, listening for the strange bird call, which expanded to say, Tatagik, Tatagik, Isrum Meksakti, Isrum Meksakti, or father and son, father and son, the source of intelligence, the source of thought. Darkness would send him hurrying home, where his mother, fearful lest something should happen to her only son, anxiously watched for him from the top of the bluff. Concerned by his long absences, his mother asked him where he had been and what he had been doing. Letting her in on his secret, he told her, I have been listening to the wonderful sound of a small bird. It calls out to me, father and son, father and son, the source of intelligence the source of thought. I am now going to tell the story of how Mani Lorak lived. When Mani Lorak was a boy, he often went out into the country and soon he even hardly helped his mother with the chores. When he left in the morning, he stayed out all day, sitting on a tree stump, all day. I don't know what time of the year it was, but he did this all winter. 
One day he told his mother, Today, as I sat all day at that place over yonder, someone was telling me things. I sat there all day listening to the one who talks to me. This is what he told his mother. He added, the one who talks to me is from above. His mother was afraid that he was becoming an Anutkuk, but Manilak assured her that he was not and that the messages were harmless and very pleasant. I am actually bringing home a ray of light each time I listen to it. I know that something is helping us and that the small bird calls from somewhere, the source of which I do not know. His mother wondered at his words, wondered about this power that even the Anutkut had not heard of. As he grew older, Manilak heard the source of intelligence speaking to his mind even when he was not at his resting place. He was guided in his choice of a wife, and as time passed, three children were born to them. Manilak took good care of his family. They accepted his special messages and lived a peaceful life. Life for most Inupiat was very hard. They were dominated by the customs, rituals, and superstitions of the shamans. Before the religion, the white man religion came in, was the fact that the shamans were under control. And when a shaman does something, what he does, he goes over there and he does the healing in some cases, and then in turn, he makes little rules, like, like he'd go for three days, you can't drink water or you can't do this for a certain day. And there was a lot of little things that it restricted the people from doing. And by doing that, what they did is they began to start having fear or began to look at those people as people that are powerful. And if you have, if you know, it's just like going up against a bully, you know, if you know that person is strong and then you have that fear within you, you know, not to say anything against that person or any that thing. So in a sense, the way I always look at it is Manila was an individual that tried to get the people out of bondage. In, in bondage, what I mean is that shamanism, communism, and Satanism is basically almost the same thing, but in a different form, and how they control is by fear. Some of the taboos made life very hard for Eskimo women. Young girls, upon entering puberty, were isolated from society for a time, and during childbirth, women were required to leave their homes. When it's close to deliver, he make a little hut back there behind, the, be, behind what, where they're living. I make a little hut in winter time they make a snow, a little hut, just like this kind of. And when he get to, to get deliver the baby, and he went there, and go in there with nobody, he deliver a baby right there, behind the village, back there someplace back there. That's the way they're living. And a girl, when he getting a little bit age, you know, they always keep him someplace back there too. When they start uh, get to a woman, 
they make a little house and keep back there. I don't know how long, less than a month, I think, a week or something like that. People will don't know the young girls when they um, have their peri periods, because those girls used to stay outside of the village too for one year. So that's how they will change. Manilik felt compassion for women and spoke out against these cruel practices. He defended the worth of women in a society where boys were considered of greater value and predicted that these traditions would someday be banished. You don't have to be afraid, these shamans, and say these young ladies that had their period for the very first time had to live by themselves for one whole year. So he would go out there and he'd visit them. Other superstitions that dominated their lives had to do with fishing, hunting, and the treatment of animal skins. They cannot sew in summertime. They can't work on skins in summertime. When the leaves start growing, they can't do these skins. When he was across in Sisolik, there were certain kind of fish you couldn't eat during the summertime. And he mixed the two together. There was berries and some kind of fish, or there was something that you couldn't eat during the summertime. Or there was um, beluga and some other kind of fruit or berries, I forget what it was. But he went over there and he ate those. And sit there and tell him, see, see, nothing is going to happen to me. Manilik looked for opportunities to show that these customs had no power over him. As he fearlessly broke the taboos, the people began to see that his source of power was stronger than the power of the Inutkut. He explained that his power came from above, while the Inutkut received their power from the earth. There is nothing to fear. I have demonstrated the freedom that is to come. He assured the people that his source of intelligence was watching over them, keeping them safe from danger and that it would do away with the suffering and fear caused by the earthly power. He admonished them against killing, stealing, and all wrongdoing against one another. They were amazed that he did not fear the Inutkut or their power. They could not imagine that someday death from the taboos would cease and the Inutkut would no longer practice their trade. Fearful that Manilik was destroying their power over the people, the Inutkut determined to kill him. They were able to kill people through their helping spirits. In a trance, they would find the person and perform their magic over him. Many people died in their sleep or from diseases as a result. But the Inutkut had no power to destroy Manilik. He was protected by a bright glow, which some of them described as a thin beam of light coming down from the sky and encircling Manilik and his family. The people were surprised that Manilik and his family didn't notice their protection of light and seemed unconcerned and unafraid of the Inutkut's power. One time, after the white man came, maybe, uh, around the white man came, and he said, they start, they knew about the uh, alcoholic, you know, the barrels, of alcoholic, and some people, didn't, they knew drinking. And three witches, real power of a uh, devil, just come and just come and walk around so the people were scary and hardly to see these people. Of course they're real no use to laughing around with them down at Katibu. And Manila was right there. And he said, I'm gonna wake these people. I'm gonna say something to them. And he, they wait and wait, these three big men, the power. He come right to them. Manila was sit right there in a the trail. He said, "What, what, what you guys doing right now? And make scary people going back from here." And this man, three man, power of a witch, 
They start laughing to himself. Talk. This Manila said, go back. I love scary of you guys. Go back now. And he start, start laughing again, these people. Manila saying again, go back, I'm gonna swallow you guys pretty soon. Now this witch is so laugh, laugh. When they try to swallow us, we have something, we got a good power. They start walking back. And people see at it and see at it, kind of scary, you know, the other people. But Manila was never scary. The people, they see it, they're kind of comfortable. It's not as scary with these three men, power of a witch, power of a devil. They can kill him right now. If, if, if people, they know this real power. They really have power, they're always killing people just by the power of them. Now that in that evening, Manila went to bed. Now that time they had a tent from white people after the white people came. And these three men they talked to each other and now we have to kill them. Now we go walk over there and kill them. They start walking and walking and come close to that uh, tent. So bright like this light. Try to check inside. They want to check it, but they can't see nothing inside. So bright. So these witches are kind of scary and go back. They can't do nothing with it. That's something. Those shamans a long time ago guys did a lot of traveling. What they did is they, you know, when they did their thing is that their body was supposed to move, and their spirit moved from their body. And then long time ago, you're not supposed to touch them like this. If they were in that prince, and usually what they do is they travel in the sky, like a little ball of fire. Okay, here there's a ball and then there's a tail. And that's how they travel. And you know, they travel all over the world. In fact, you know, there's stories of people traveling into big cities and all these other stuff. The shamans were, of course, were uh, offended in a lot of cases and they tried in their powers to be able to try to do away with them and try to do all kind of things that they normally do with the powers that they have. But one of the things that they came up to him was the fact that he had a little light within him and a few years ago, my grandmother came down to this very house and told me about, about, um, about uh, this little light. And she, my grandmother is about 82 years old. And she came down here and told me that say, some, at some point in your life, you're going to be a, a leader for our people. And one thing that you got to keep in mind is that there are a lot of people within this, in our region that are shamans yet. And they still practice it, but what they're doing is they're underground. Oh. One religion came, one religion came, all those people that practice it out openly went underground because it wasn't accepted to be able to do it and perform it in front of the people. So my grandmother went over there and told me and said that when you become a leader, the element that you'll be going will be those people. And when those people try to do it to you, he said, I'll give you a I'll give you uh, like a, a, a shield. And she said, I'll tell you about that shield. That little shield in you is what you call light. And this is the very thing that Manila had. When all the people tried to, tried to do a number on him, they came up with this light that was so powerful that they couldn't penetrate to his spirit because there was this light. And my grandmother was telling me, she said, this spirit, by the way, is uh, religion, knowing Jesus, by living according to the gospel, according to the scriptures. And if you believe, and if you have real strong faith in your religion, and if you really believe in God and, and in Jesus, that you have this light within you. While the shamans used amulets, charms, and fetishes for their rites, Manilik did not need these things. <laughs> Mani Lorak was my father's uncle. 
They say that he was like that from the beginning. It was his nature. After he slept at night, in the morning he would say that the one who put words in his mind gave him something to say. The people living around would say he was practicing to become a shaman. That's what the people said about him. Since he was not practicing shamanism, he said, he was not bothering people at all. Still, people said, he was practicing shamanism. He ignored them. He never gave up. After he slept, he said, the one who gave him words in his mind or dreams gave him something to say, and then he would talk about the predictions. When he was ready to tell the people the words given to him by his grandfather in the sky, he beat a drum, sang a few songs, and spoke the words, Yai, Yai, which expressed praise and awe. He always began by telling them that life as they knew it would soon change. They would be freed from their fears and superstitions. Manilik's predictions aroused the people's curiosity. Some taunted and ridiculed him. Others listened skeptically. They said, the devil power will be gone no more after change people will change to the other power that's something that's real power than the devil power i have to understand from this book the white people will will talk to the eskimos so the eskimos will change living but this man, Manila, told lots of people this wouldn't be happening anymore pretty soon. It's coming pretty soon. Things going to be changed. People going to do whatever they want to. No more kungoks. No more kungoks and ugly knocks. Ugly knocks mean superstitions. Later on, our people living, they won't know anything about that kind. It will go on. They are always telling us, tell the people that time, that way. The Iveksat, or white-skinned people, would come up the Kobuk River after rounding a peninsula along the ocean. Although he said this many times, no one really believed him. He told them that the white-skinned travelers would come swiftly over the surface of the water in fire-powered kayaks. They also would travel swiftly through the air by firepower. You too, he told the people, will be able to sit in your boats and move across the water without rowing or pushing it. You too will sit in your boats and move across the sky. He said, people will be sitting in a little boat and not paddling. Because when people want to go someplace, they have paddle. Or when they have kayak, they paddle. On account of moving and going someplace, they paddle. So Maniak said there will be no paddling. People will get in a little boat and sit down and they will start moving real fast, or real slow, or real fast. Something will be controlling their boat, some kind of little, something that moving behind them will, will control their boat. That means engine or even rude to them. Uh, mm -hmm. After he said that, he said, this little boat will be traveling in the air pretty soon after that. 
and still this something that runs will control this little boat and they will start to travel real quick to other villages. When they want to go, they will just fly. They will get in this boat and will start flying again. And so people were visiting real quick. That means the airplanes then, what he prophesied about the airplanes then. Later, we moved to Shungnat village and lived there. The Fergusons came and we had a sawmill at Kuchak. One day we heard a strange noise. We climbed up to the sawmill area where they were working. Whenever they sawed logs, we climbed up to watch because they were close to where we lived. My friends Tommy Kutachak Lee, Urgachok, and some others were there with me as we climbed up. We didn't climb far when the noise we heard was coming closer. Suddenly, we saw something in the sky. It was approaching fast. It had windows and a windshield. Two people were sitting in this vessel, one behind the other. People started running around in Shungnak. As the airplane circled around, there was much confusion. That was when we saw the first airplane. It was predicted that it would come in from the direction of Kobuk village, which is east. When it landed, the passenger was an Eskimo. They recognized him. He had lived in the upper Kobuk area before that. His name was Nuleyuk. He had moved away quite a while back. What Manilak went over there and, and was trying to help our people. He went over there and he made all kind of predictions. And he went over and said, okay, these are the events that's going to happen. These are the things that we're going to do. So that way, when we encountered with these elements of, of the Western society coming in, we were so odd that we would, take, we would be taken advantage of. And in a sense, the stories that goes along with that, and let me give me an example of a few of them. When the white man came with his plane, it didn't um, startle the uh, Eskimos upper Kobuk that were that lived and, and listened to Manila when he was in when he was in upper Rift, uh, upper Shangnak, I mean upper Kobuk. But you went down further to where, like Norvik and different places that never, you know, really maybe take his story seriously or even listen to him, they thought that was the end of the world. And they panicked some were running around outside, you know, just like went outside and started praying. And in fact, the story goes to where one man, went, you know, fell on his back trying to watch his plane, <laughs> you know, every second of the wind fell right on his back because, um, you know, it, people lost their minds. And I think if we went over there, and, and, and I personally went over there, when I studied Manila, like, you know, I, I sit there and I think in, in contrast in terms of what he was trying to tell us and what we went through, and then it can even still apply in this day and age because, you know, we're always, you know, just like we're, we're going to be living in the last days, and there's obviously there's going to be antichrist to where if we're not in tune with our religion, and we don't have the power and source that we're, we're aware of, is that we don't know what kind of source that's going to be around. And if the, any kind of event, a disaster, any, any of these type of things, I think that can be our sources and that can be our strength in terms of the things that were expected, that were told to us by Manila. Manilak practiced some customs that seemed strange and contrary to Inupiaq ways. He washed and took baths, something unheard of among his people. He predicted that one day they also would clean themselves. 
his dad, Kayena, take my dad holding his hand and walk over there where this crazy man, they thought he was crazy, but he was not crazy. And so when they go in, he welcome them and then they sit down and then he got a bowl of water and a rock. But he mentioned this rock will be something else that will cleanse your, your hands and your face, make them clean. That's the way later on, some years after, they gonna use some kind of a wrong thing to clean your face and your hands. And he washed. He washed with the water, with the rock. And then after he washed, he, he tell them, that's the way they're going to start living later on. They're going to wash all the time. People are going to wash. It was Manilik's custom, wherever he made a camp or home, to set up a tall pole. Although his people had no calendar and didn't divide the days into weeks, Manilik taught that the day on which he attached an animal skin flag to the pole was a day to rest and to worship. This happened every seventh day. On that day, he did no work, but spent the day talking of his predictions. Some people accused him of being lazy, but he replied that he was living by the commandments of his grandfather. Since I have been asked to tell a story, I will try to tell about Manilak. Manilak is my real grandpa. I am from the upper Kobuk area from Kala, which is where Manilak is from. My name is Imalurak, and my English name is Joe Sun. I will begin by saying that Manilak said many things. Many elders knew him years ago. But now, they have since died. Manilak lived, did his chores, and rested every seven days. He said, I honor this day. And he raised a pole, attached a small flag at the tip of the pole, and rested. The person who told me this was Kumuk, brother of the Booths, across from Katsibu at Sisolik. Manilik raised his pole. Kumuk followed some older boys and peeked into Manilik's tent. They saw him lying and resting. He did not do anything on that seventh day. So when Kumuk said that Manilak was resting on the seventh day, that is what Manilak did. He told people about a day of rest. He said, this is the day I rest. On that day, he rested. He did not do any chores. It was like a Sunday. He stayed put on this certain day. He mentioned there'll be a seventh day resting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He put his fingers out like this and it makes seven. On the seventh day, 
you have to be still and no work on the seventh day. You can work on the six days, but on seventh day you go no, you're not going to work. That rule is coming soon. Everybody will be resting on seventh day pretty soon. All these years and years will be coming and going, but there'll be seven day resting and no work. He uh, always pulled up, put his pole up on the seventh day and let people, people know that it's a seventh day. Everybody have to rest on that day. Whenever they see Manila's pole, that means he remind them this is a holy day maybe, and they don't have to work that day. I always say it sometimes about that Sabbath day to keep it holy, because mm -hmm. God's commandments telling us to keep it holy. And he called me, Mom, how come we always go to church at Sunday? I think Sabbath is the right way. He telling me, he understand a boy. Mm. He understand it. That right there was a day of rest. Obviously he had, um, he had no more religion than what the people people knew, knew about, and that's what he was trying to tell the people. That's the reason I, uh, when I, you know, studied this right here was that, that he was an individual from our own people trying to tell our own people that, you know, that religion was important in our lives, and if we have that, that would help us to be stronger people. Now, once we, now, when, when he was gone, then we had the um, Western religion when it came, when it came in, then we did had the religion in the native sense, in the uh, native sense, because we were close to nature. But one of the things that we don't have was that we didn't have the story of Jesus. See, that's the part that we didn't have, and that we began to start understanding, yeah, there was a God, there was a power, there was a source, and here was a son that had been sacrificed to us and given to us for, 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 for redeeming the people, you know, and so here, see, here it was, that, so when the, missionary and the religion came in, you know, those people were very, very religious people. They were strong. And any, I'll say, any church that came up during that time, I don't care what kind of church it was, could have been the predominant church. And the church that came up here to our region during that time was the Quakers, or what you call the French church. And, but those people, you know, grabbed onto it and they were absorbing every story, everything, and they lived according to according to how the church set, a, set that thing up. When Manilik was ridiculed for his strange ideas and practices, he said that his grandfather above was more powerful than everything else and deserved the highest respect and obedience. He said, unless I am directed by the one above who was dressed in white and whose aides are also dressed in white, I do not speak. Although the grandfather above did not demonstrate his greatness now, he explained, the time would come when his glorious power would be seen. And people, when they ever visit who told you from where you got these words? From where did you get the idea of saying these things? And he said, Abba, Abba, he said, Abba. Abba is up there, he's a human being. Abba, but they call him Abba. Because that Abba told him to say these things. He listening to up there what he have to say. And he he give Manila words to say these things. Most of Manila's predictions have now come to pass. 
The lives of his people have been changed by the knowledge of the Father above. The power of the Anutkut has been broken. The bondage of superstition, fear, and cruelty is gone. The coming of white-skinned people, fire-powered kayaks in the water and in the sky, fire inside to warm the houses, thin birch bark upon which to write, the ability to talk and hear over long distances, light coming in the form of the Bible, have all happened as Manilik predicted. But Manilik's last predictions have not yet come to pass. Those who have known his story look for the fulfillment of these things in the future. Manilik predicted a discovery where the town of Ambler is located, the discovery of something greatly valued by the white-skinned people. Then Ambler would become densely populated, with people living on both sides of the river. After this, a whale will appear at the mouth of the Redstone River. How this can be, no one knows, because the river is far inland. But many believe it will happen. We hear about Amler going to be a, a big, big city sometimes later on. That what Amani Yora say. You know, in that uh, across from Amler, that point that was a uh, deep, deep water. At uh, one time, they tried to measure it how deep are, but it never land there on the ground. And he said that big whale, black whale, will come up. I don't know when, when it's going to come up from in there, in that deep place. After um, this, this village will will be a big city. Way back to the mountains, the lights will be. And after it's set, that point will drop. And after drop, the, the whale will come up. And after that, he can see the future from there. These were the last signs, a whale, Two consecutive seasons with snow to the tops of the spruce trees, flood, famine and hardship, the end of all things. Manilik himself did not seem to know what it all meant. He was filled with great sadness. The future after this seemed dangerous and difficult. Many believe that when he spoke of the Eviksat, he predicted the coming of the white man from the east. But even before Manilik's time, the word alluded to a future event when white beings would come from the direction of daylight and the dead would be raised to life. It was to be a great day, and the people comforted one another, saying it would be the time when they would all see one another again. Manilik told about a time when the bodies of people would be changed, and old and young alike would be youthful again. In Point Hope, they spoke of the Eviksat, a land of all good people that would come down rotating as it arrived, but never touching the ground. Then all the good people would simply step into it. This land was abundant in plants and flowers, a beautiful and joyful place, the land of the good people. Manilik saw a place glowing with such radiance that it was too bright for the naked eye. He tried to recognize the city, but it was beyond his comprehension. A song he composed called it a place which has beautiful weather or sky. He said, he point his finger at my dad and he said, this little boy, I mean, this little boy will be real old, maybe, maybe after he die, people will change. In a wink or twinkle of an eye, people will become young. Old people, gray haired, will be young again. 
Young people and old people will be the same. Everybody will be young, become young again. But he doubted if this boy will be alive or real pretty, pretty old when this thing happened. <clears throat> then this part of his story is related to the Bible, that if Jesus come in a wink of an eye, twinkle of an eye, when Jesus come, that's how fast he gonna come. Once he was telling me about Maniyak, what he wishing. He see a vision up in the air, not in the land, but in the air. He see a vision, and he try to get close, but he can't see it. Too bright for his eyes, too bright to go into there, a city. That was a big city, bright, and he can even see it. So he tried many ways to get closer. Maybe he must be rounded or something like that, but he can get close to that, what he see it. Finally, he leave that city alone cause he can see it good. His eyes is not good to go in. So he leave that alone and and I don't know what what he do after that. He was telling about it so many times. What he said, I don't understand what it means. When I was thinking about it, that must be a new Jerusalem. That uh, city, what he see it, he was thinking so much and he want to understand what it means. But he start make a song with it. They used to make a song that time in Eskimo. Just only few words from that song, I only learned it. My dad was singing, that was a long Eskimo song. I never tried to learn it because I didn't know I gonna reach this one right there. And he sing a song. He see it that he call it Nunachluk, Nunachluk. So me tam na siyav yag rovak in me nyepa. And he, and he make a song, just, just that piece, you know, I learned it. It was a long one, all right, but I never tried to learn it. This is how the knowledge of God came to the Eskimo people of the far north. Not willing that any should perish, God broke the bondage of darkness and shined the light of heaven upon them. Has this source of intelligence spoken to you? Have you heard his voice? He has a revelation for you, a message that will deliver you from bondage, a message that invites you to that beautiful land, the land of the good people. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. <laughs> 